Today, I would like to teach you how to use the rational zero theorem to find the real zeros of the following polynomial function. So the first question is, well, what in the world is the rational zero theorem? Well, let me just explain it very quickly. Basically what it says is that if you take the factors of your constant term, which the constant term is negative 80, you'd have to find the factors of that. And then you take the factors of your leading coefficient, which is the coefficient of the highest power of x. And you were to take then the factors of the constant term and divide it by then the factors of your leading coefficient. Some combination of those divisions will be a rational zero of the function. So let's label the factors of the constant term p. Looks like a row, p, there we go. And let's label the factors of the leading coefficient a q. So basically what we're doing is we're going to find the factors of the constant term p. And we're going to divide it then by the factors of the leading coefficient. We call that q. So what are the factors of, oh, goody gumdrops, negative 80? Well, let's think. We would have 1 times 80. Okay, that's right. You're thinking about whole numbers that multiply to whole numbers that multiply to 80. So that's going to be plus minus. And then, I guess I gotta move this over. And then you're gonna have a two. You're gonna see how ridiculous this is gonna get. And then you're gonna have a positive or a negative two, and you're also gonna have a positive and negative 40. Okay, how about three? Well, three doesn't work. How about four? Yeah, four should work, right? Positive and negative four, and then that should be a 20, right? Positive and negative 20. How about five? Well, five will work as well. Okay, five will work as well. So you're going to have a positive and negative 5. Oops, positive and negative 5. And then you're going to have a, so when you do that, that's going to be a 3, 0, 6. Okay, so that's going to be a 16, right? Positive and negative 16. Let me just double check because my brain is a little slow right now. Okay, good. Um, what else are we going to have? Are we going to have 6? I don't feel like thinking anymore. So let's just divide it by 6. Nope, that's not going to work. 7, I definitely know, is not going to work. 8, well, definitely 8 will work, right? So then you'll have plus minus eight, and then you'll have plus minus 10. Okay, sorry if the numbers are getting a little small. But anyway, these should then be, once you start getting close, as you can see, eight and 10, you know the only number that's kind of a whole number in the middle is a nine, and you know nine isn't gonna work. So you know you're done at that point, all right? I like to work from outside in. Then you're gonna list the factors of your leading coefficient, which is just a plus and minus one. Okay, so now. We have all of these possible now combinations, meaning you could take a positive one divided by a positive one. That would give you a value of one. This is a possible rational zero of this function, possible. You could have also taken though the negative one and divided it by the negative one there, which would have given you the same value of one. Okay, so that doesn't give us a new value to test. But you could have taken then positive and negative, uh, excuse me, positive one divided then by a negative one. That would have given you a negative one. And you could have taken then a negative one on the top and divided it by the positive one. I don't know why five came up in my mind, but that would have given you a negative one as well. So if you notice, although I have like four different combinations, technically between the signs and whatnot, I really will only have two possible values, positive one and negative one. Now that's going to be true for all of these numbers. So basically what you have is you have the possible zeros of plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus four, plus or minus five, plus or minus eight, plus or minus 10, etc. Now think about this for two seconds. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 numbers positive and negative. So you have 20 different combinations to test, okay, that we're going to test. Now, that's kind of ridiculous. Is it really reasonable to use the rational zero theorem to find the real zeros? I don't know. If you want to do 20 tests, then sure, right? But um, I don't really want to test this thing 20 times. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to graph this thing quickly. Okay, so I can get an idea of what the real zero should be, and then I'll show you how the how we would then go about it, so that we don't have to kind of sit here and guess at it all day long. So this is x cubed, so just graph it, x cubed, 
plus 5x squared, all right, minus 16x, and then minus 80. And then hit graph. Now, if we notice here, let's blow this up a little bit. That's the blow up noise. So we have zeros. Remember, zeros are going to be the values of x where the function crosses the x-axis, okay? We have three zeros, and we should expect that because we have a cubic, so we should have a maximum number of three, all right, real zeros. Each one of these tick marks represents a unit of one. So this is negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, and negative five, okay? So according to this graph, now how, you might say, how do you know that's exactly, you know, those values? I, I don't, actually. I would have to use the calculator to solve, uh, but I'm pretty sure that the function that they're giving us here is going to be kind of nice, where we're going to have like whole numbers, okay? So um, let's write those out. So one of the zeros is going to be, as we mentioned, a negative five. One of them is going to be a negative four. And then the other value here is going to be a one, two, three, and a positive four, okay? X is going to be equal to positive four. Okay, so now at least we have, you know, something to kind of go off of here. All right. So now that I know like what I'm looking for, I don't have to do, let's say 20 tests. Okay. I can just do, I'm going to do two tests for you and then you're going to see how this would have played out. Okay. So the idea now is once you locate or identify those values of P over Q, remember we would have plus and minus one, plus and minus two, dot, 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 dot. You would have to test them inside of this function and see if those values gave you a value of zero. Okay, this is, this is now called the remainder theorem, okay? What you do is you're going to take, so let's test a certain number. I'm going to test positive, I'll, I'll test one because that'll be nice and easy. Let's test positive one, okay? Now I know that shouldn't, it should not work because positive one is not a zero, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to take one of your division values, which we said is positive one, and what you're going to do is you're basically going to take this, then zero, and you're going to plug it in for x everywhere you see x in the function. Okay, so we're going to do it just like this. It's going to be 1 cubed plus then 5 times 1 squared minus then 16 times 1 minus then 80 is equal to zero. Now what I'm looking to do here in terms of the remainder theorem, I have a bunch of videos on that if you'd like to check out the playlist. But the remainder theorem basically says what I'm doing here is I'm finding the f of 1. Okay, that's really what I'm doing. And if this thing equals 0, if this is a true statement, okay, that it equals 0, then I know that whatever number I plugged in here is a 0 of the function. Okay, it's going to divide it evenly, basically. That's because the remainder is 0. So why don't we check it out? 1 plus 5 minus 16 minus 80. You don't even need to combine this now. Is that going to be a zero? Definitely not. So what that means is if, if this does not equal zero, then I know whatever number I tested is not going to be a real zero. It's not a zero of the function. And that's what we expected. We know that these are the actual zeros and one should not have worked, which it didn't. But now what happens if we go and test a real, you know, one of the one of the actual values? So it doesn't matter to me which one you like to choose. Why don't we plug in here? I don't know which one you want to do. What? Negative four? Perfect. All right, negative four. So let's plug that in. Negative four. All right. Negative four. Okay, so now what we're going to do is evaluate this, and that should be a negative four, right? I heard you. I heard you. So negative four. Now what we're going to do, I'm just going to use, I'm going to be a little lazy. I'm going to use the calculator. Make sure though, when you do this, please use parentheses. Because if you notice, if you, if you, let's say square, because the sign's going to change. If you, that's not a square. If you square negative four in parentheses, it becomes a positive 16. But if you plug in negative four and then squared, it's still a negative 16. Because what the calculator is doing, it's just squaring the four, not the negative four here. All right, so you got to be very careful when you plug things into the calculator. Get used to writing it with parentheses whenever you substitute a value on in. Okay, so parentheses negative 4, cube that, and then plus uh, 5 parentheses negative 4 squared, then minus 16 parentheses negative 4, and then minus 80. And voila, it does equal 0. 
So once we substitute in the value of negative 4, and we get basically a remainder of 0, we then know that whatever number we plugged in here, which was negative 4, is going to be a 0 of the function. So x should be equal to negative 4, which it was. All right. Now remember, you have 20 numbers to test, but only three of them are going to work. This isn't realistic to actually use this fully, okay, to find the to find the answer. What you can do is you can hope that, you know, you don't, imagine, imagine if you do this like from left to right, but the answers are all the way over here. You're going to have to test 17, you know, 18, 16 values, whatever, before you even get an answer. This is just unrealistic, all right? Um, the goal might be, though, is once you find a zero, if you find it soon, what you can then do is you can use the factor of this zero, x plus 4, divide it then on into this polynomial. Let me just clean that up because we don't really need the p's and the q's anymore. All right, you can then divide that factor on into this polynomial via synthetic division, and then you can find the new quotient, which would be some x squared value, you know, be some quadratic. And then you can take that quadratic and apply nice methods to find the other factors and the other zeros. Okay? Um, but again, that's a long, long process. But the, no matter what, this this is going to be a long thing. All right? But to, to purely use the rational zero theorem to find the real zeros of something is a little bit unrealistic, especially if you have 20 different possibilities. Anyway. Guys, thanks for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. I do hope this helped. Um, if it did, like and subscribe. That would be awesome. We appreciate so much your support, and maybe even tell some of your classmates. And if you're ever looking for one-on-one -on -one help, we do provide that. Visit our website, glazertutoring.com, and we look forward to helping you with more problems. And also check out our YouTube channel, because we have thousands of videos, not only in math, but chemistry and physics as well. We got your back. We got your back. We solve specific problems, because guess what you're going to see on your exam? Specific problems. Take care.